Coming up next, our series of continued conversations with leaders of the travel industry. This week, our talk with chairman and owner of Silver Sea Cruises, Manfredi Lefebvre de Video, on the state of the cruise industry. So what have you seen as the largest change in the cruise ship industry? We've seen a lot of changes. We've seen uh, the ships getting bigger. We've seen the ships getting more specialized. We've seen the ships getting with more amenities on board, more dining options. So I did see the trend will be always more and more this. On one side polarizing, you will have top level ships which will cure for, the, cure for the details for the people and other ships which will be bigger and bigger offering all sorts of things. But when you talk about the changes, I remember 20 years ago there was one dining room you had and because of the passenger load you had to have two different seatings for dinner. You had one showroom. I mean everything was really quite limited. It was quite limited, it was quite planned. So you were, the cruise vacation was a planned cruise. You would have the excursions, you would have the dining times and all of this. It was I, more rigid. It was more rigid, yes. Silver Sea started with a concept of total freedom, uh, very broad dining uh, hours. Uh, you choose if you want to be alone, if you want to be with somebody else, you choose the time in which you want to go, you choose your restaurant. We've been adding more and more restaurants because of this. Um, you go and you go to the bar, you order your drinks, you don't have to stop and pay. It's becoming much, much more flexible in our segment. I, I suppose one of the great definitions of luxury travel is you get to keep your options. And I mean, I, would you agree with that definition? Absolutely. Well, that's luxury in general. The freedom of choosing what you want in a, any given moment. But then it gets into the whole concept of uh, a backlash, if you will, against what, what people are calling nickel and diming. At the airline business, people are upset about it. Uh, in the hotel business, people are upset about it. And perhaps even in the cruise business, when you check into your room, you know, and there's a bottle of water and they want to charge you six or seven dollars, you know what a bottle of water costs. It sends the wrong message sometimes. Well, in upscale market, the tendency is very clear, no nickeling and diming. We, we've eliminated substantially the Wi-Fi costs, charges. You have free water in your cabin. You have free water everywhere. You have free drinks. You have uh, com uh, complimentary wines. So on Silver Sea, this is not the case. And when you see the cruise lines building more and more ships, the challenge, of course, is where do you put them? Where do you deploy your ships? Well, that is a challenge, I think, because with geopolitics, sometimes the world shrinks. Today, it's very difficult to go and cruise in the Black Sea, or in the South Mediterranean, or uh, in the coast of the Middle East. So it is sometimes challenging, but you have new areas which open. And then you have new experiences. We do the expedition ships which go everywhere. You don't need to have a port facility. We go in the Arctic and the Antarctic. We go, we've done the Northwest Passage. Eventually we will do the Northeast Passage. We do the Russian Far East. So uh, from this point of view, there are areas which open up. Uh, traditional areas sometimes have challenges. And yet you have situations where, uh, I mean, you can't control the fuel prices. Uh, you can't control world economy. And, and you know, you, you had a situation where you had all these ships being built before 9-11, then 9-11 happened, and people didn't travel, and there was a huge excess in capacity. Is there a huge excess in capacity now? There used to be, in every given moment, about uh, 14 ships being built. Now there, there were seven, uh, so there was half. Of course, now, even if we go to 10, they're much bigger, the 10 ships are 180,000 tons and not 90,000 tons. And that becomes the next question. Can the ships get too big? Too big for what? From a safety point of view, from a technical point of view, from the passenger requirement point of view. We've seen that the passengers always more accept or like bigger ships. The new ships of Royal Caribbean have been a tremendous success. 250,000 tons. 6,000 passengers. 6,000 passengers because then you have two destinations, the ship and the destination. And yet, your ships don't qualify as mega ships intentionally. Yeah, no, we, we try to remain always at a level where you can move around easily. If you forget your uh, sun uh, cream in the swimming pool, you go to your room and you don't have to walk for half an hour. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's gonna be easy to go back and move around. You find the same people all the, the place, you recognize each other. It's a more of a community. It's more intimate. It's intimate and it's a gathering. 
It's, uh, it's not dispersive. So what you're saying is that if you segment your market in the industry itself. I'm saying that that's what's happening. Yeah. The more the industry is mature, the more it's being segmented. Not only within each market, for the US market, for the European market, but for nations. So you'll have a cruise line for Germans, you have a cruise line for French, you have a cruise line for G Chinese, you have a cruise line for the people who want to see remote areas, um, disembarking with Zodiacs, you have a cruise line for people who want to be on a big city uh, like uh, the Oasis of the Seas. So you have, a, it's, it's a mature industry which offers to each one his own requirements. Now, people have to understand who offers what. That is a challenge for the industry, giving the message what you want, you want this, I'm offering it to you. Right, you have to communicate properly, otherwise people get disappointed. Yeah, yeah but you know, the bombardment of offers, of course, may be immense. What about price? Well, pricing, if you look at the pricing, uh, there's a lot of room to increase because the pricing will be remain very, very low. But mm -hmm. for the consumers, that's great. If you look at the comparison between a vacation on a cruise ship and a vacation on land, I think that you save about 40% on a cruise ship at the end of your vacation. It's incredible the amount of uh, the efficiency of the vacation. Break that down for me. Well, yeah, I mean, you're an Australian. You fly to Europe and you have option A, you embark on Silver Sea. Uh, besides the convenience that you unpack and pack once, and, but uh, besides that, you want to see 10 ports, 10 places. Every day you have to take your taxi, go to the airport, take an airlift, arrive, give the tip to the porter, take another taxi, go back to the hotel, uh, check in, give a tip, have your luggage brought in, the, in your room, and then you have your breakfast, you pay for it. You have your drinks, you pay for it. You have uh, uh, your lunch, you pay for it. You have tea time, you pay for it. You have your dinner, you pay for it. You have a show, you pay for it. If you put all together, what is offered on a cruise ship, the saving is huge. Besides the convenience, because people do not choose the cruise industry, the cruise lines because we are cheaper. They choose it because we are more convenient. You visit the Mediterranean, embarking in Venice and disembarking in Istanbul. Now, what about the age of the ships? Because that's, all, that's a relative term. You have a relatively young fleet. The age of the ships, you know, it's, all, it's a question of being technically updated and from a consumer point of view, what they want. Because we spend so much money refurbishing the ships that they're always new. What's the biggest surprise for you about the way that the cruise industry has evolved? What was the one thing you weren't expecting? Uh, maybe I wasn't expecting that uh, the, the, the big cruise ships would uh, adopt so many of the things that we have uh, introduced with alternative dining, et cetera, et cetera, so fast, which is good for the industry. Maybe I wouldn't have expected it would have grown so big. So fast? So big, so fast, but so big. I mean, I probably wasn't expecting that. When I started uh, in the cruise industry in 1987, well, I would not have imagined probably that the ships would have been 250,000 tons. And the numbers, the actual growth curve, I mean, there was a time not too long ago that only about 13% of the adult U.S. population had ever taken a cruise. Yeah. Right. What is it today? If you look at China, it's growing by 70% a year. 70? 70% 70 a year, yeah, growth. Chinese market. So it has nowhere to go but up. Of course, yeah. yeah. And that's only China. Then you have Indonesia, Malaysia, you have all the Far East, uh, the rest of the Far East, Southeast Asia, so-called. Forget India, another 1.2 billion. Uh, forget uh, China, 1.2 billion. You have Korea, Japan, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, all of these countries, hardworking people. Many have raw material, they have oil, they have everything. So these are economies which are flourishing. But cruising has a certain aura to it for them that they aspire to do it now. That's, well. Some aspire, no? So the problem is to get the message through. But if only 3% aspire to do it, that's a huge number. Yeah, yeah. but remember, the 3% of what? Of the population, there's a no different number of vacation days that a European will take compared to a Vietnamese or to an American. 
So, I mean, uh, and, uh, the potential of a European market is much bigger because the Europeans take much more vacations. The Americans, a bit after them, if you go to the Asians, they still take very little vacations. So, and, so the cruise product in Asia will be very short cruises? Will be short cruises for some, long cruises for others. I mean, you have the retired people there. For example, in China, there's a big market potential, which is the retired, because the young people are making more money, but they have a huge respect for their elderly. So they want to offer them a, 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 a vacation. And what better a vacation where it's Chinese, language spoken is Chinese, the food is Chinese, they feel safe, you know? And the last question is on the distribution system. Because if you look at the airline business, they used to be primarily travel agency, and now it's internet. Uh, hotels, trying to steer back to internet as well. The cruise industry is still travel agency. Well, the still industry is still travel agency, but the growth is a lot through direct. So in reality, we're, we're growing with, with travel agents, but we're growing also direct. Because it's still industry is growing so much, the cruise industry is growing so much. Do you see a price point differentiation when it comes to distribution, meaning if you are a Carnival cruise or a Royal Caribbean cruise, there's more direct, but if you're a Silver Sea cruise at a higher price point, people want a conversation with a travel agent? No. The important thing is that we never compete against a travel agent. So we don't offer anything better, anything cheaper. You have price integrity, meaning what you're gonna charge me is what the internet's going to charge me. Yeah, that is what we all try to do because the travel agents look at us and if we do something different, they get angry. So we all try to promote travel agents and direct in parallel. A difficult dance. It's simply you're opening the options to what the people want. And at the end of the day, you know, it's difficult to plan 10, 15, 20 years out. What about five years out? What do you see happening in the cruise industry five years from now? Well, five years from now, I see that there's going to be a, a big development with not only China, but also Southeast Asia. That is, I think, the biggest uh, new thing. Then, of course, I think expedition cruising is going to develop a lot. And for the rest, there's going to be more bigger ships. Huge ships. Every cruise line will go competing around 180,000, 200, 250,000 ships. You will see that, I think, with Norwegian, you will see it with MSC, eventually. But part of your definition of your own ships is not to be too big. Well, that's my market. So in my market, we, why, why do I build a new ship which is 600 passengers? Because I see that that size still allows intimacy, quality service, one-to-one -one service, the people are individuals, they get recognized on board, and they're not just numbers. So I think that that is the key components for the luxury market. So you've reached your, your point. That you don't want to go bigger than that. Today, no. Tomorrow, I don't know. It will be depend on what the consumer looks for. And of course, there are certain requirements. With a 600 passenger ship, which is 200, 210 meters long, you can go in certain ports. If the ship is bigger, you lose a number of ports. You can't, you can't get in there. And, uh, and that is part of the luxury product. You go not only to the big ports, you go to smaller ports. You offer a lot of variety. Which is the problem, say, in Alaska, because uh, in, a, in a given summer season, you can have seven ships in one port in one day. Yeah. But Alaska, notwithstanding this, is still a great experience, so people go. Even on the on Silver Sea, we are there, we're always packed full. So people know that they're going to Alaska, which is beautiful. There's going to be a lot of other ships there, which is not so nice for them. But they choose to come with Silver Sea because then when they're on board for long hours, they have a different kind of service. I think we got it. Yeah, we got it. Done. Okay. All right. Our next conversation will be with Gianni Honorato, CEO of MSC Cruises. Look for that right here on PeterGreenberg.com. I'm Peter Greenberg, and thanks for watching.